Now, it's going to be a packed show, so I'm going to speak for a little less time than normal, just to lay out the subjects we'll be discussing this evening. Uh, the most important of which is the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, an important event, a world-changing event, and an auspicious number, 75. The actual anniversary is on Thursday, uh, but we are giving it a full treatment tonight with Dr. Francis Boyle from the United States, an expert, not just about nuclear weapons, but about the law as governed or not governed, the hideous weaponry that can end the entire world, the entire existence of not just human species, but all species on the planet. It, uh, I have been myself, I've spoken in Hiroshima and in Nagasaki. I don't know which anniversary it was. It may even have been the 60th. Uh, I was on a speaking tour of Japan and I have never forgotten uh, the ominous feeling, a bit like being on Elm Street in Dallas the feeling of foreboding uh, that one has when present there and remembering uh, that day when the United States dropped the first atomic bomb ever dropped in human history. And days later, uh, the second uh, on uh, Nagasaki. Nagasaki's bomb was entirely unnecessary, even within the terms of the military uh, case uh, that the United States might have been able to make for dropping the bomb on Hiroshima. After all, they said uh, they would have had to fight island to island. They would have had to fight their way right up the entirety of Japan, house to house. The Japanese were a fanatical enemy, ready to fight to the death, to defend the warmongering emperor, and all of those arguments have at least some military basis for argumentation, but the second one had none because Japan was already not just on its knees, but flat on its back after the dropping of the first bomb. The dropping of the second bomb had much more to do with what they imagined to be the world war to come. It was dropped to terrify the then Soviet Union with the United States earth shattering earth-changing atomic power. Uh, that uh, monopoly on nuclear weapons, of course, didn't last for very long. Uh, thanks to people inside the scientific community and inside the British intelligence services, sorry to bring it up, lads, uh, who felt that uh, a nuclear monopoly uh, by one superpower was really not a good idea, it was a profoundly dangerous and unhealthy idea, and so they leaked the US atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, and very quickly, within uh, not that many years, five years, four years, the Soviet Union had the nuclear bomb also, and a long period of nuclear stalemate kept the peace, as we used to keep being told, for many decades uh, thereafter. And, of course, as the 20th century wore on, uh, we negotiated treaties to limit uh, the number of nuclear weapons, which by then had become hundreds of times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But those two are increasingly called into question uh, by the unilateralism of the United States government under Donald Trump, which has ripped up more treaties than I have time to talk about this evening and may very well uh, be about to trigger another nuclear arms race, another nuclear free for all. So we'll be talking, of course, uh, about that. But we cannot ignore the unsealing of what will come to be known as the Ghislaine Maxwell Papers, though to be fair, they should be known as the Jeffrey Epstein Ghislaine Maxwell Papers, uh, because she was a co-conspirator, allegedly, with him in the wholesale rape of young girls and the 
sexual procurement of underage girls and their trafficking across state lines and indeed across national boundaries, even here in London. Uh, Victoria Jufre, for example, is alleged in the papers uh, to have been trafficked out of the United States while still a child to London where she was forced by Jeffrey Epstein, allegedly, with the collusion, collaboration of Ghislaine Maxwell to sleep with a member of the British royal family, which, if true, uh, would mean uh, the crime of rape had been committed. Uh, because it is said, it is alleged, uh, that the same prince slept with the same girl in the United States and in the American Virgin Islands. And if that was true, uh, then that prince would be guilty of rape. So it doesn't get much more serious than that, except Prince Andrew is actually a bit player compared to the luminaries who are revealed in these papers uh, to have been almost certainly filmed having illicit, illegal sex with minors and that that information was then used to blackmail them for financial, maybe, or political, maybe, purposes. And those included, according to the Victoria Jufre testimony, a Spanish president. Now, Spain doesn't have a president, of course. It has a king. But it does have a prime minister. And that prime minister is in uh, the Epstein Black Book. His name was Aznar, and he was a war criminal in the Iraq War alongside Tony Blair and George W. Bush. And it appears he was a close associate of Epstein Maxwell. So the Spanish president uh, that Victoria Jufre refers to could, of course, have been him. I should say that Prince Andrew denies these allegations. He's not sweating uh, over these revelations. As a matter of fact, he can't sweat, as he told us in his ill-advised interview with the BBC. But if he could sweat, he might sweat over the fact that the ante has been upped by the releasing of these papers. And Ghislaine Maxwell is now in a very difficult place, between a rock and a hard place. She's behind the eight ball. She's in prison at least until next summer. And if found guilty of the charges under which she is arraigned, she'll go to prison for between 35 and 40 years, in other words, for the rest of her life. So she has a very powerful incentive to tell the prosecutors what they would like to know. That presupposes that the prosecutors really would like to know it. And that is also an open question. We'll be talking to Garland Nixon, an American broadcaster of note, a journalist and a man who knows the law because, well, he used to be a police officer. He's one of my favorite people in the United States. And we'll be asking him about the impact of the Epstein-Maxwell papers being unsealed. But we can't avoid the smell of formaldehyde. Each new week brings yet another video, testimony or evidence uh, that Joe Biden is quite gaga. So much so uh, that uh, one of his putative vice presidential candidates was forced to roll her eyes on television this week as he literally babbled incoherently. He also appeared at a community center and announced it as quite another community center. And then said, bizarrely, no, that was the community center in which I used to work. But as he's been a congressman, a senator, a vice president of the United States, for as long as most people have been alive, it's difficult to know when he could have worked in a community center and why the name of that community center popped into his head when he was in a quite different community center speaking to people, trying to encourage them to vote 
to elect him as the president of the United States. Donald Trump's madness, of course, well charted. I'm reading his niece's uh, biography at the moment. No doubt there's a lot of score settling going on. No doubt there's a lot of money uh, to be made uh, by being the president's niece and writing bad things about him. But my goodness, they are very, very bad things. And if even a quarter, if even a tenth of what his niece has to say in this book is true, then, well, I keep saying it, it's really summing up the current state of the United States empire that Joe Biden is fighting Donald Trump for the presidency. Now, I mentioned Florida earlier. It now has more coronavirus cases than the entirety of the European Union. In fact, if Florida was a state, it would be one of the most afflicted states uh, on the planet. But Britain's not far behind. And the question is, are we about to get a spike, a so-called second wave, now that everyone, certainly at Brighton, is cheek by jowl on their deck chairs on the beach? And people are more or less willfully disregarding social distancing regulations. Mind you, more than half the people in Britain don't understand what the regulations are. And they can be forgiven for that because they seem to change from week to week. They seem to promise but not deliver. The issue of testing and tracking, tracing, all of these things appear to have been almost abandoned and billions spent on them in the process of abandonment. And different parts of Britain are now facing different rules and regulations, leading to the situation where people like Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister in the Scottish Assembly, uh, telling people from Greater Manchester not to come to Scotland. That's the official position of the SNP administration in the Scottish Assembly, but the madmen of the Scottish nationalist Barmy Army have taken the law into their own hands. They are standing on the England-Scotland border, telling practically the only people in the world who might go to Scotland for a holiday, for a staycation, to get the F out of Scotland. And then they took it to the airports and to the central station in Glasgow, where they held up a banner uh, saying England out of Scotland. If it had said Pakistan out of Scotland or Ireland out of Scotland or Asians out of Scotland, well, the banner waivers would already be in jail. They'd be on a charge. Uh, but you can say what you like in Scotland about England, the place where more than 60% of Scotland's exports go to. It's all boiling up north of the administrative border. And as you can tell, I'm deeply interested in that. Well, enough uh, from me. This is episode 59 of the mother of all talk shows. I'm going to count up, maybe tonight, maybe for next week when we get to 60, how many millions of you have watched and listened to this show in the last 59 weeks. I tell you, it's an eye-opener. <laughs>